Welcome back, and thanks for tuning in to episode 53 of Lab Padres SpaceX and Starbase Weekly Updates. We've got some good stuff for you today, so let's dig in. Starting off this week at Starbase, Saturday morning, Rover Cam caught a Starlink dispenser being lowered into Ship 30's payload barrel section for installation. That night, the same crane was spotted lifting pipes into the section that will be used to connect to the header tank in the ship nose cone. On Monday morning, the turntable base that was delivered to the mid-bay last week was lifted and moved to the high bay for installation. The next morning, a new ring with six clamps for securing a starship was lifted and installed on the new stand base that is being installed near the rocket garden, which can be seen here thanks to Mauricio from RGV Aerial Photography. Starting Tuesday, new Raptor engines were spotted moving to Mega Bay, likely for installation on Booster 9. The center engines will be the first booster engines with the electric thrust vector control. That evening, Ship 26 was rolled out of High Bay following a short stay and parked in the ring yard to make space for future ship stacking operations. The next morning, Ship 28's nose cone section was moved into High Bay as SpaceX was wasting no time moving to start stacking the next Starship. By that afternoon, the Ship 28 payload section, complete with its payload bay door, followed the nose cone into high bay ahead of stacking. Late Wednesday, the new nose cone test article was rolled down Highway 4 to the new Massey's testing site. Here, the nose cone cage, which has recently been cut in half to fit this test article, as seen in this aerial shot from Mauricio, will be lifted and installed over this nose cone in preparation for testing. Switching over to Florida, on Friday, United Launch Alliance's rocket ship was spotted arriving in Port Canaveral to offload additional launch hardware for the rocket company. Sunday morning, Falcon 9 Booster B-1076 was lifted and placed onto the transporter for its trip back to Hangar X to be prepared for its next mission. The next day, fairing recovery vessel Bob towed just read the instructions back into Port Canaveral with booster B-1078 from the Crew-6 launch. Working quickly by that afternoon, the booster was lifted off the drone ship and placed on the stand on the dock for processing. On Tuesday morning, Bob was already heading back out to sea, this time in support of the OneWeb-17 launch. By Wednesday, initial processing was complete on booster B-1078 and it was lifted and placed onto the waiting transporter for its trip to SpaceX refurbishment facilities. On Thursday, the first of ULA's new Vulcan rockets was rolled out of their vertical integration facility and delivered to the launch site for initial tank tests as they work towards its inaugural launch. A short time later, GatorCam caught SpaceX's launch of 41 web satellites on their way to polar low Earth orbit. Several minutes later, Falcon 9 booster B-1062 reappeared from behind the clouds as the first stage rocket returned to the Cape to land at landing zone 1. This week, the great Greg Scott once again took a trip through the Florida skies to bring us a Cape Canaveral update. At Launch Complex 39B, NASA continues to work to prepare the site for the next Artemis mission. Meanwhile, outside the Vehicle Assembly Building, the mobile launcher is also undergoing work in preparation for that same launch. At SpaceX's Launch Complex 39A, progress on the Starship infrastructure seems to have slowed, but is still moving forward. The LR 1150 crane has been disassembled but is still remaining at the pad. A new mobile crane with luffing jib has recently arrived and started working on the tower. SpaceX's facilities at Roberts Road continue to be a hub of activity for the busy space company. Hangar X's calm white exterior belies the busiest interior of the Falcon 9 refurbishment facility. An SPMT configured for Falcon 9 sits in the driveway on the southern end of the building waiting for its next cargo, but it likely won't wait long as SpaceX has already launched 16 rockets in the first 10 weeks of this year. Over on the other side of the site, crews continue to work on the prefabricated sections of the next Starship launch tower. Even though it appears that all the steel is on site, no new sections have been built since the last flyover, likely due to the assembly crane leaving the site. While no piping or conduit has yet been installed on these modules, the lifts in the air tell us that the work is still actively underway. Near the tower sections is the end of the QD arm. It is not known why it is here and not by the rest of the arm. 
Just east of the tower area, good progress is being made on the newest set of the Mechazilla chopsticks and the carriage while the second tower's QD arm is still waiting for its trip to the launch site. With the disassembly of the LR-11-350, however, it is unclear when SpaceX plans to move forward with the installation of the arm. With the hinge pieces of both chopsticks being added seemingly simultaneously, the main structure of the arms appears to be rapidly nearing completion. Just to the south, the Roberts Road Star Factory is nearly weather tight and has had 12 of its rooftop HVAC units already installed. It appears that only the final corner remains to be finished with regards to roofing and cladding. Unfortunately, once again, as of this flyover, steel work has yet to move forward on the first of this Florida mega bay. Some workers and a telehandler in the area, however, may be a signal that that will change soon. To the south, Blue Origin continues to work developing their new Glen rocket while also expanding their facilities. This week, the tank cleaning and testing facility was closed. It is not known if a new Glen first stage tank was inside. Luckily, however, the second stage cleaning and testing building was open, giving us a look inside. New since the last time we saw inside the 2CAT facility is a stand which should hold the second stage during testing. Outside one of the buildings on the northern campus was a transporter and some other New Glen related hardware. The white tarped items looked like they could be cradles for transporting the rocket horizontally and the blue tarped items looked like it could possibly be a tank dome. Let us know below what you think this hardware is. The southern campus on the site is largely an active construction site. West of the existing warehouse building and the new addition to its southern end, Blue Origin is busy with a large expansion of their Cape Canaveral facilities. The first two buildings now appear to be structurally complete. The first building, built of white truss wall box columns and sporting a 30-ton bridge crane, is Blue Origin's new vertical assembly building. Next to it, the roofing and cladding are being installed on the new Reef Pathfinder building. To the north of these two buildings, crews are preparing for the foundations of a third new building. From the current excavations, it appears that this outline will be only the western part of the new composite assembly building. Blue Origin's Launch Complex 36 will be used to launch their new Glen rocket and could possibly see some vehicle testing later this year. Just to the north of Blue Origin's production facilities is Kennedy Space Center's Visitor Complex. On the east side of the site is the Rocket Garden and the new Gateway Building. These provide visitors with a great opportunity to get up close with some rockets and really get a feel for their size. On the west side of the facility is the Atlantis Building where the actual Space Shuttle Atlantis is on display. Here, behind the replicas of the shuttle's external tank and solid rocket booster, you can see a T-38 Talon jet on display, which NASA used to use to train astronauts. Some activity was seen at Space Launch Complex 46 that was possibly related to the recent Scrub Department of Defense hypersonic missile test. Fire was seen from the last flare stack at Launch Complex 16 as Relativity Space was attempting to launch its Terran 1 3D printed rocket for the first time. Unfortunately, that launch was scrubbed due to propellant temperature issues on the second stage. Finally for this week, a quick tour through the port where ULA's rocket ship, which typically delivers the company's rocket and other launch hardware to the Cape, was spotted at the dock in the port's mid-basin. Around the corner, several of SpaceX's marine assets were also docked. Fairing recovery vessel Doug was between missions having recently returned from a day at sea with a shortfall of gravitas likely for sea trials. Dragon recovery vessel Megan was also in port waiting to head out in support of the Crew-5 splashdown. A shortfall of gravitas, SpaceX's newest autonomous spaceport drone ship was tied to the dock following the previously mentioned suspected sea trials with Doug. The deck of SpaceX's other East Coast drone ship, Just Read the Instructions, was a hive of activity as the vessel had just recently returned to port with Falcon 9 booster B-1078 from the Crew-6 launch. The massive octagrabber, which is used to secure the boosters to the deck during the trip back to port, was still out and being serviced to prepare for its next mission. On the shore is one of the not-for-flight fairing halves that SpaceX crews use to train for recovery operations. Nearby, the very clean-looking B-1078 was already on the transporter awaiting its move back to Hangar X for refurbishment following its first launch. And there you have it! 
Another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update with a splash of Blue Origin, brought to you by Lab Padre. We'll see you next week, and thanks for watching. Lab Padre, out.